Let me just share a few things this morning. Let me get this Amen. As I said earlier, um, things like this are humbling to me. Uh, I appreciate all your kind gestures. And, uh, this is phenomenal. It's a blessing to us. And as God has blessed you, that you bless us. Um, I pray that we're always a blessing to you. Uh, I pray that we never overlook your need. Uh, we'll never be intentional. Uh, but we, we definitely want to make sure that we always do our very best to meet your needs and to serve you to the best capacity, but to lead you in the best capacity as well. That was a beautiful uh, uh, video when we played with the uh, young people, the song, all that work, signs, practice, work. Thank you. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, everything and the food that's to come, we appreciate that. Let me, uh, because I think it's needful, let me just share a few things when it comes to past appreciation. Uh, I'm not even telling you uh, that you need to appreciate me. I want you to see what the Word of God says. Uh, uh, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter number 4, verse 11 through 16, And He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Uh, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man, and the cunning craftiness by, uh, the, by whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speak the truth in love. May grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compact by that which every joint supplied according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. <coughs> I know that there is a five-fold ministry that is given here. I know some will say three, but I believe five-fold. And uh, that ministry that is given, uh, there last, he says, and pastors for the perfecting of the saints. Uh, there, the number five is used Several times, there, there are the bars that, uh, that down the, the tabernacle that Moses built. We find that there are, are, are five pillars as you enter into the holy place. Uh, uh, the five uh, articles of furniture in the tabernacle. You find Aaron and his four sons. You find that Jesus used five loaves. You find that uh, when they look for the cloud, uh, he said, I see a cloud as the size of a man's fist. Uh, five fingers there. You find that there are five senses in our body. And so you find that there are fivefold ministries, but we find that there is that of the pastor. You find that in the original text, if you go back to the original writing, uh, you'll find that in the Old Testament and both in the New Testament, that that can be translated as shepherd. Now I know that some folks will say, well, Jesus is the chief shepherd and the good shepherd. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, but, but God has so ordained uh, the, the working of the church that He placed shepherds in the church. And uh, it comes with a very high calling and a great responsibility. A huge responsibility. Uh, and so, in saying that, uh, I, I, I want you to know that we are honored that we can be the shepherd of Miracle Revival Church. And uh, we realize that it comes with a very huge responsibility. I look out and I see lives that are here this morning. But they're not in lives, but they're souls that are destined to an eternal destination. So it's our responsibility to do our very best before God to make sure that every soul that is here this morning, and even souls that may not be here, are affected for the kingdom of God in a way that they know the Word of God. 
They know that salvation is necessary. That they see the love of God through their pastor. And who uh, uh, ultimately they begin to look beyond that of just the pastor. And they see the great shepherd who loves and cares for their soul. So it's a huge responsibility this morning. And uh, I, I desire that God would, would help us in that responsibility. Do you realize that this morning shepherding is an occupation that is needful for those who are saved? They realize how important it is to have a shepherd. But to those who aren't saved, they don't understand the importance of having a shepherd. In fact, the Word of God describes it this way. If you look at Genesis 46, verse number 33 through verse number 44, you'll find that when God called Moses, he said, he said the Egyptians don't understand that of the shepherd. They think that the position of being a shepherd is an abomination, that it's a terrible thing. Who needs a shepherd? So Egypt is described as being that of the world. The world doesn't understand why it's important to go to church and belong to a church and put yourself under the place of where there is a shepherd in a church. Mm -hmm. Do you realize that we talk about church attendance and its importance. It's not just a, another star in your crowd as having a number, but, but church attendance and being faithful to a church is important because it's saying, I realize that God has placed shepherds there for a reason. And I want my life to be shepherded for the kingdom of God. I want to be part of the fold. I want to be led in the right direction because ultimately I'm submitting myself to the chief shepherd shepherd, which is Jesus Christ. So this morning, part of being a pastor, October has been set aside as pastor appreciation month. You think about that because God has placed shepherds that care for you and love you. In John chapter number 10, Jesus shares a parable about a shepherd and he talks about the sheepfold, and he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth some other way, is a thief and a robber. And he that entereth the, do the door, uh, but he that entereth the door, he is the shepherd of the sheep. Something I realized that any of you that's been here for a long period of time, I, I didn't push my way or open the door to be the pastor of Maricory about the church. In fact, it was a very long process of me realizing what God was doing in my life and in this church and, and being a shepherd. But the Word of God says that there are many that would want to climb over the wall, a thief and a robber, a stranger. See, there's some things about sheep, and I'm just trying to educate you this morning and show you the importance of church and the importance of having a pastor and allowing yourself to be under the care of the pastor. The Bible says that there are strangers. There's a lot of voices in the world. But I pray to God that every time you come to Miracle Revival Church, that the voice that you hear from this pulpit wouldn't be that of Bobby Seville, but it would be that of this is the shepherd that God has placed over me. So I want to hear his voice because he's guiding me and he's caring for me. I'm part of the sheepfold. The shepherd, he loves me and he wants the best for me. There's a lot of strangers, a lot of folks who turn into a lot of voices and I'm not going to begin to name voices, but you know, for you as sheep, for us in Miracle Revival Church, be careful the voices that you listen to. Mm -hmm. Do they really care for your soul? Are they concerned about your eternity? Are they concerned about your growth and your well-being and that you're led in the right way? So there's a lot of strangers. The Bible says that there are thieves. Do you know thieves are very crafty? It's not like they just come with guns, and, and, but they're crafty. Some people know how to get their way into where they want to get, and then they begin to take what they want. You have to be careful that someone doesn't take advantage of you and your soul. A good shepherd I will care for your soul. will not want to steal from you, but give to you. 
A robber, he's the one who comes in by force and by violence and he takes away. There's a lot of people that would want to get in your life and, and see you destroyed. But oh, the shepherd, he loves you. And so there is that uh -huh. power like, that, that he really doesn't care about the flock. The only thing he cares about is his personal gain. Uh -huh. Friend, I never ever want someone to look and say, all he cares about is himself. I want folks to say, man, that shepherd, he is a shepherd. He cares for sheep. He's not concerned about what he can gain from them, but what he can do for their well-being, making sure that they're intact and they're cared for, and that they reproduce, and, and that they, uh, they, they, they're, they're, they're taken care of. And then there's that of the wolf who devours and scatters. There's some, some wolves who come dressed, the Bible says, in sheep's clothing, it come to skies, but a real shepherd, he loves his sheep. The Bible says, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. Let me tell you what a pastor will do. You see, because a real pastor, the sheep will recognize that he's a good shepherd. See, a real pastor will be one who recognizes the needs of people's inward souls. We all have inward needs, and I want to make sure that our inward needs are taken care of. See, a pastor will be sensitive as the sheep sit and as they, they rest. He leadeth me through green pastures talking about God, but a real shepherd will be with folks when they sit and they just need to rest. We'll be there to listen and not always to speak. The one that will be patient and, and, and gentle. A real pastor will call his sheep by name. Do you know a shepherd knows his sheep by name? He knows every one of them by name. I, I want to know you. I want to know what makes you tick. I want to know your passions and, and, and the things about you because you're part of a flock in America without the church. See, a real pastor will lead his sheep into fresh green pastures. I don't want to live in the same pasture. I don't want to live in yesterday, but I want for the big fresh green pastures. And I want that for you. You're not the person who you was just but you, you are the same and that is your history, but you've grown and you've changed and you've matured and, 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 and I want to bring us to new pastures. A real pastor, a pastor will uh, lead his sheep and he'll lead his sheep in such a way that his sheep is happy to follow him with new visions and new goals. I want us to do great things in America without the church. I want us to reach our community. I want us to grow and mature spiritually. How do we get there? Lead me. Lead me, God, that I may lead America without the church. But this is the thing, a real shepherd will lay down his life for sheep. He's willing to stay when he sees a wolf coming and he's willing to fight. A real shepherd is always on the alert to see other sheep being brought to the fold. A real pastor recognizes that there is only one fold, but his flock is a part of a great fold that is God's. The great and the chief shepherd. The real pastor will recognize that his sheep aren't his, but they really belong to the chief shepherd. You're really not mine, but you're God's. So I have to handle you in such a way and lead you and guide you, knowing that ultimately someday I'm going to give account to God. Mm -hmm. For every message I've preached, for every need that I've met, even for the ones that I didn't meet, I'm going to talk to God. So I want to be a pioneer of Miracle of the Church. See, I want us to be good sheep here. I don't want us to be goats. If you look back in, 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 in the, the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, you'll find that goats were, they were stinky and they weren't really beneficial for anything. But sheep, they were beneficial. Because 
You can lead them. You can benefit from their milk. You can benefit because they were sacrifices. You can benefit from the wool. You can benefit from what they can provide. You know what? Every one of you in here are valuable. You are sheep. And you're part of the fold at Miracle Revival Church. And we want to lead you in the right direction as the great shepherd leads and guides us. I want to share a few things really quickly. I see the time this morning, but I just want to share something from the Word of God. It's something that if you uh, you keep notes, you'll find that 15 years ago I shared this with you. So I'd like to revisit it very quickly this morning. In Exodus chapter number 3, the Bible says, uh, God speaking to Moses. Remember, Moses was raised in Pharaoh's home. Uh, he tried to do things his own way. He slays an Egyptian. He's on the run. He's a fugitive. But that's been many years ago, over 40 years ago. And now he's taking care of his father-in-law, Jethro's sheep. And he's in that place where he, he notices a burning bush and God speaks to him from the burning bush. And the Bible says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am that sent me unto you. And let's just stop there. If you go a little bit farther, we read that God speaks and identifies Himself as the I Am here to Moses in the Old Testament. You go to the New Testament in the book of John, John chapter number 6, Jesus identifies and He refers to Himself as being the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the shepherd. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the vine. But in order to understand all of who Jesus says that He is, we better have to, have to understand what God was speaking to Moses way back here in the book of Exodus. And I want to speak this to you for just a few minutes. I'll be very quick. But I want to remind you of a few things this morning. Here is Moses. He's 80 plus years old. Look at, at Exodus 7-7. Seven, seven. You'll find that it identifies his age. And he, he, he's watching his father while sheep. Maybe he's dealing with disappointments. Maybe he's dealing with old age. Maybe he's dealing with what has been, uh, what could have been, what will be. So he notices that there's a burning bush. And, and as he's there, he notices that it's not being consumed. So he, he turns aside. Maybe a burning bush isn't an unusual uh, uh, object for him. But this time it's very unusual because uh, the object in which it's being burnt is not being consumed. And so he, he makes his way. And the Bible says that God speaks to him. And he says, wait a second, Moses. I want you to take your shoes off because the ground on which you're standing. It's not just common ground. It's not any ground. But this is holy ground. Take your shoes off. And so he takes his shoes off and he comes aside and he listens to God. I believe that there are moments in our lives where we need to recognize that God is in the place and God is working and moving. And so let's take our shoes off. This isn't just a, a Sunday. This isn't just another day. This isn't just lichens. This isn't just Miracle Revival Church. But this is holy ground and God is working and moving and he wants to speak to us. And so the Bible says that, that, that God begins to speak to him. And he says, Moses, I want to use you. And I want to do something in your life. You are going to be the redeemer. You are going to be the spokesman. You are going to be the leader of my people. But there's some tough work that you've got to do. You've got to go to Pharaoh. And he said, wait a second. He begins to go through all the excuses of why he is not able, he is not adequate to do what God has called him to do. We can be full of excuses, amen, but when God calls us to live and to work for him, amen, our adequacies will not meet standards, but his ability will cause us to triumph. Mm -hmm. And so God says to him, he says, Moses, I'm going to be with you. But who am I going to say has sent me? Identify yourself, God. And he says, tell them that the I am, that I am has sent me. I want to look at this for just a few brief, quick moments. Please join me. Engage. I know food's waiting. 
I'm hungry too. I'm looking forward to it. But let's let God first. So what was, what was God saying? God was saying to Moses, in literal translation, it would be translated this, I am who I am. I want us to think about this this morning. God was speaking to Moses. And He was saying to Moses, I want you to know that I am the God of the present. I am the God of the present. Sometimes I believe that we need to get there. We realize that He is the God of the present. No matter what our personal ability is and no matter what the task is before us, that we have a God of the present moment that will help us with anything that we are going through. You may say, Brother Sunville, I've never faced the mountain like I'm about to climb. I want you to know that you've never had a God that's changed. He is still the God of the present. Amen. Would you engage Him in the present moment and know that it's not about your ability, but it's about God and His ability and is being with you. Jesus said this, I am with you always. Amen. We look back at our life in retrospect and we see how good God has been and how God has helped us, but God has called us to this present moment and He wants us to know that He's still God of the moment. He has not changed. He has not depleted. Amen. He is still right here with us. Amen. And so when, when, when Moses asked God, who are God. And Moses, as they realized this, that when you gave someone your ability to know your name, that you gave them power over you. That's a big thing. If I don't know who you are, I don't know your name. But even in their custom and culture, if you didn't know someone's name in a personal way, you had no power with them. You had no ability to, to call them or, or to command them. But God said this, I give you my name because I give you power. I want you to know this morning that none of us are exempt from knowing God. God Almighty, Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. We know Him and we know Him by name. Mm -hmm. And we have power with Him. When we call on the name of Jesus, uh, chains are broken. Demons flee. Uh, the current situation, which seems so strong, is depleted before us because we know the God of the present moment. See, God, He wanted Moses to go and tell Israel, I'm a very present help with you. Don't be so preoccupied with what you're doing or concerned about your future that you forget that I'm a God of the present moment. I want you to stop right now. What are the things you're facing? See, we have God in Containers. We have the container of the past where we see God's been faithful. We have the container of the future where God is our hope. But I'm asking you to release God from the container and know that God's the God of the present moment. Mm -hmm. That He's here with us and He's able to do Hallelujah. in us. I'm the God of the present. He said, I'm the God of the past. He said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, and the God of Isaac. Let me just share with you really quick. Why, why did he say that to them? I'm the God of the past. Remind yourself of the past. Abraham, that's your great patriarch. The greatest of the great, I was their God. And I was with him. I was with him as I called him out of his homeland and I provided for him. I was with him as, as he trusted me for his son. I was with him when he took that son to Mount Moriah. I was with him when he journeyed, when he was all alone and I provided for him and I, I multiplied him. But he says this also, I'm the God of Isaac. We don't know much about Isaac. He's kind of sandwiched somewhere between Abraham and Jacob. There's only one chapter in the Word of God that is devoted to Him where the other two men, there are many chapters but He says this, I'm not the God of the greatest but I want you to know I'm the God of the least. You may feel insignificant you may feel unimportant you may feel like you're the least and even if you feel that way or even if you are I want you to know that I'm not just the God of the greatest but I am the God of 
the least. And then we look at Jacob, who's some of the most unrighteous. He was a supplanter, but we wrestled with God and God changed him. He said, I'm the God of the unrighteous, and I'm the God of the righteous. I am. I've been the God of the past, and I'm the God of the present. But he said, I want you to know I'm the God of the future. Near future, yeah. distant future. There is nothing that I am going to do. Because I am. So, Charlie, if you're going to look at it, just a few minutes this morning. I know it's past appreciation. I know we've got things going on. And I'm humble and I'm grateful for everything. But I just want to remind a few people this morning in the sermon that God is still God. You look at your life and you say, man, God's been faithful. This week I celebrated my birthday on Wednesday. Wow, I can't believe I'm this old. But I'm telling you, I'm getting older. But I was working at the hospital Took my drive down through Clark's Valley. That was a very uh, beautiful drive. I looked at the trees of the mountain there. They were turning all different types of color. And as I was driving, my Wednesday morning drive is devoted just for some time for me and God. No radio, no telephone, no nothing. It's just some time for me to prepare my heart to get ready for work. Or for me to have a little bit of time for me alone with God. Was it far to my day dealing with someone in their 20s dying? Dealing with someone in their 50s, early 50s, who bam, their life has changed and they're about to die. Someone in their 40s dying. I begin to realize, Bo David, how blessed I am. I realize that God is God for those people, but God is God for me. He's not a God of what has been. He's been faithful. I look back over my life and I look through personal loss. Give me a few moments. 17, my dad died very unexpected. God's been faithful. God's been faithful. I look and I see how that God took me to Bible school. He called me here. He's provided for me. He provided a wonderful wife. He's provided two beautiful children. He provided a wonderful church family. We sought him for a home. He provided us a home. It's humble, but it's ours. And God is faithful. But I'm not done there. What God do you have for me today and in the future? What are the goals that I have? So as I was driving, I was thinking about this, Sister Rachel. I was thinking, there are some things that a year from now or five years from now isn't going to matter, so why am I worried about it? But I want to look at the things that do matter. This morning, would you take focus of the things that really matter in your life and know that He's not only the God of the past, not only the God of your future, but He's the God of the present who's able to meet your needs. And you're going to find that even though this moment may not be the moment you want to live in, that God's going to be faithful to you. Maybe some of you, you have a life by the tail. Enjoy it, my friend. Enjoy it because God's provided it for you. In fact, it's a moment to store up because there may be some tougher roads down the road where you're going to reflect on God's goodness. But would you grab a hold of God so, God, you are the I am that I hold to you. Know that you're holding to me and take care of me. Would you right where you are, stand to your feet if you are able, if you're not understood. But would you close your eyes?